Good morning, welcome. If everyone will take their seat, we'll get started right away. We're thrilled to have Governor Ned Lamont with us. And uh, whoever set up the television in the rectory uh, when I moved in, had it set up that it always opens up to channel 12. And inevitably, within 30 to 60 seconds on the news station, our governor's on, thanking people, greeting people, answering questions, or making some special announcement. So it's been a wonderful way to keep up with our governor, and we're so thrilled to have him here. You've done an outstanding job of leading our state through the pandemic, and we could not be more grateful. Other states have not been as fortunate. Your leadership has made a huge difference. On behalf of everyone at Christ Church Greenwich, uh, we are deeply, deeply grateful to you for what you've done. Governor Lamont was born in Washington, D.C. on January 3rd, 1954. He attended the Phillips Exeter uh, Academy, where he served as president of the school newspaper, and later majored in sociology at Harvard University before getting his master's in business administration from the Yale School of Management. The governor was involved in public service early on in his career when he started a weekly newspaper in a town hit by losing its major, um, its largest employer. And in so doing, he helped that community to have a voice, to have transparency in what was going on, and to begin the process of reinventing itself. He later served as a member of the Greenwich Board of Selectmen and the Board of uh, Tax Estimate and Taxation. And four years later, he served as chairman of the State Investment Advisory Council. He eventually started his own company, working with over 400 colleges across the country and more than a million students. And while running the company, he volunteered teaching at the Harding High School in Bridgeport, teaching students about the inner workings of small businesses, bringing in uh, local small business owners, and also helping them to find local internships. He also served as adjunct professor of political science and philosophy at the Central Connecticut State University. And in 2009, he helped lead an initiative to bring together leaders from across business, nonprofit, uh, and labor sectors to unite in a strategy to create more jobs here in Connecticut. In 2006, he challenged long term, uh, longtime incumbent Joe Lieberman for the Democratic nomination to the United States Senate. And he later served on boards of the Mercy Corps and the Conservation Services Group. As governor, he's been very focused on creating more business opportunities for the Nutmeg State. And on a personal note, I can say that the governor is a fine tennis player. After three months of being your rector, I had a chance to play tennis with the governor. And, and after the first set ended, I went to the net and we exchanged pleasantries. And I said, Governor, I hear it's been a great challenge with the tax issues here in Greenwich, and we're seeing people leave to go to Florida and other states, what can be done? And I thought, what an opportunity after three months in a new community. Governor Lamont is married to Annie, who has more than 30 years experience of venture capital investing. In 2014, she helped to launch Oak HCFT, a venture capital firm that invests in healthcare information and uh, financial uh, and financial services. Together, they're proud parents of three children, Emily, Lindsay, and Teddy. Please join me in welcoming Governor Lamont to Christchurch. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, Merrick, I didn't tell you that after you and I played that tennis, I was walking out, and some wag says, look at that, the man who talks to God and the man who talks to Dodd. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, like I love being here. I see, you know, so many friends, um, uh, and this is my favorite place in the world. And it's really nice to be having a home game uh, today because uh, I travel a lot in this job. I'll just, Eric, pick up where you left off. That, you know, when I um, two years ago, you know, I just said this is a state that has um, lost its confidence. This is a state that hasn't added a new job in 30 years, and adding new job. Uh, sort of a fiscal train wreck, and I had a real idea of exactly what I wanted to do and how to do it. And uh, I thought we were making pretty good progress. And, uh, but as uh, George Foreman, the boxer, once said, um, 
a good swift punch to the gut can upset any strategy you may have. And that punch to the gut, as you remember, as you know too well, was, was COVID. And um, I was there like a lot of you, and you know, I'm a history major, so I was looking up coronavirus and Googling Wuhan and um, you know, doing the best I could, figuring it out, and seemed like it was a long way away. And uh, then it was Seattle and Italy, and then it was New Rochelle. And then one day, uh, we got a call saying, you've got your first infection. It's at a Danbury Hospital, and you better get out there. And uh, I was there with the doctors and nurses. You know, nobody wearing a mask. We didn't know what we were doing. And um, it would just uh, put a shiver up the spine of the state and this country. And we had to figure out what to do, how to do it, and how to reassure people. That first, uh, I used to listen to the 211 hotlines. Uh, which is uh, run by United Way. And uh, we were just getting inundated with calls that spring. Uh, am I going to die? And for me, it was, you know what you know in life, and you know what you don't know. And what you don't know, find people who know. And uh, thank God um, I was in Connecticut, and we had some of the best medical minds uh, in the world here. And it was uh, Albert Coe and... Scott Gottlieb and Yale School of Medicine and Jackson Labs, and we convene them pretty quickly. Uh, we have some great hospitals, and I saw Italy, and I saw those hospitals being overwhelmed, and I see, um, you know, gurneys in the parking lot, and um, we, we got all the hospitals together. That's just not easy. <laughs> They're a little competitive, and, um, and, and we hadn't had a great relationship with the state. They had been suing us going, going back five or 10 years, but we had solved that, put that behind us, and worked hand in glove with, um, with the hospitals. Uh, we realized we were gonna be asking people to do some things that uh, no government has ever asked them to do before. And uh, I needed trusted advocates with me. That included the religious community. Uh, that included uh, the medical community. And that included the business community, because I needed um, businesses large and small to know that we were going to be asking them to do some things. Um, and I have a, a neighbor here in Greenwich named Indra Nui. She used to run Pepsi. She had some credibility with the business community. So when we said it's, uh, we're going to have to um, you know, temporarily uh, restrict things and close things down, uh, that gave a lot of confidence. It wasn't easy. I mean, we. Um, Early on, we were hit. We were hit harder than um, you know. It was New York, New Jersey, and then Connecticut. And uh, one reason Connecticut fared relatively well compared to New York and New Jersey is that we were sort of a week or two behind, say, New York in COVID spread. And I could see it. We had a heat map. We could see it coming up by 95 Metro North. Uh, but because we were sort of two weeks behind. Uh, that meant that any restriction we put in place, we were sort of a little ahead of the curve compared to our two neighboring states. Uh, that didn't make it any easier. Um, uh, legislature wants to get involved, which I think is wonderful. Nobody wanted to close down bars over St. Patrick's Day weekend, let me tell you. <laughs> hey, you governor, you can take that one. Um, uh, you know, we had, it was the basketball, high school championships. I'm going back a you know, year, eight months ago. And uh, all of a sudden, we had to say um, no high school basketball championships. And we were getting our head handed to us. People were angry uh, until the NBA shut down four days later. Then it was, never mind. I, I think I, I get it. And Connecticut was wonderful. I mean, we were scared out of our minds. People uh, felt that fear but they all rallied. And it was, uh, you know, democracies are incredibly messy and contentious until confronted with a crisis. And then there's no place better to be than a democracy and a democracy like Connecticut where everybody rallied to the cause. Um, you know, broke my heart. Uh, we had to, um, frankly, two thirds of the schools, three quarters, including here in Greenwich, had already closed down by the time we said, um, uh, the rest of the schools have to close down. and it, um, 
was sort of funny. I had everybody protesting about basketball and football. I didn't have as many PTAs up there about schools, but I think uh, a lot of uh, parents knew what we were doing, why we were doing it. Um, we had to scramble. I just felt like I can't have this a total lost year of education. So we uh, worked hard to get um, laptops and Chromebooks to all the kids. They called it a remote or distance learning. Didn't really work that well. It worked pretty well in places like Greenwich. Didn't work as well in um, some of our cities where the kids didn't necessarily have the um, infrastructure to support them. Um, but we did the best we could. Uh, it was really hard because everybody was so isolated. Uh, I'm afraid I probably heard from more than a few of you when we said uh, we can't have visitors into our nursing homes. As you know, our nursing homes were just um, a petri dish. It was so dangerous. And um, I heard about that loud and clear and we, um, losing contact with a lot of our loved ones there. Um, a lot of our elderly were at home and uh, we had to recast how we did things very quickly. And uh, again, uh, we were thousands of volunteers stepped forward, especially younger volunteers who at that point we thought were much less likely to at least suffer complications related to COVID. And we had our own little grub hub where people were delivering meals, knocking on doors. Um, and uh, Connecticut I, I just led the way in terms of um, what we're able to do together going forward. Uh, I wanted to give people just a certain sense of confidence that this was not going to be forever. And we were thinking about the reopening, uh, even as we had barely uh, closed things down. And uh, I got Rick Levin from uh, Yale and uh, Albert Coe and Indra and others to um, start putting in place a reopening committee for all of our uh, educational um, universities, um, you know, prep schools, high school going forward. And uh, that ended up being a template uh, around the country. And, you know, for me, um, we got through the summer. Remember the summer um, year ago last summer was pretty good. You know, rates were down. We thought, boy, maybe it was, um, uh, maybe we're out of the woods. Um, you know, one advantage of being a history person is, uh, you know, I started reading about 1918, and I just remember seeing there were a number of blips after the first hit. In fact, the second hit in um, 1919 was worse than the first hit. So, you know, we were ready. Um, but I also really pushed hard to get our kids back into school. And uh, there, were, there was some pushback, right? I mean, the teachers were nervous as heck. Um, a lot of the teachers lived in multi-generational housing. You know, my grandmother's upstairs. Um, it's dangerous for me to go. And I just tried to make the case, um, you know, one school at a time. Nothing's more dangerous than uh, not having your kids in school. And uh, we found, uh, this is a year ago, September, that um, our classrooms were um, probably the safest um, places to be in the state at that point. That was even after, you know, we had that second, you know, surge came around. Um, uh, it was not controversial then, it's controversial now, but um, we, we asked everybody to wear a mask in the school. And uh, that really kept the infection rate low, and it made an enormous difference in terms of keeping our schools open. You, you maybe remember one kid was exposed to somebody, and we were quarantining and closing things down for two weeks. So uh, the mask gave people an awful lot of confidence uh, going forward. You know, testing, uh, we just figured we had to know what the scope of the problem was. and. Uh, and a lot of people were reluctant to test, just like a lot of people uh, were reluctant to vaccinate. And there, we really, you know, I used to think, hey, just um, go online, go to CT vaccine, sign up, or go to CT test, and you can all do it. That's not the way it works for half our folks. They don't have access. They don't know how to do it. We're older. We don't even know what our passcode is or have an email address. So, um, myself included. And um, so, Eric, we really need, that's where the religious community stood up in a really significant way and uh, spoke to their congregations as a trusted advocate when it came to telling people what we had to do. Our African American churches were nervous as hell about um, testing and vaccines. And uh, we worked really, you know, Tuskegee, a lot of reasons there was distrust. And we uh, went to those ministers and um, we set it up uh, testing and then vaccine. Um, 
vans right at the parking lots as people came out of church. Um, you know, the minister would say, I, I can't tell you what to do, but I talked to God and I'm gonna go get vaccinated. I hope you do too. <laughs> it was pretty compelling. <laughs> and uh, so here we are uh, a year and a half later and we have more of our people vaccinated and a lower infection rate than any state in the country. And that's, that's thanks to all of you. And everybody did it a different way. I mean, you know, New York, um, you know, they, they find you $10,000, you know? Andrew was pretty tough. <laughs> uh, I, that wasn't our way. Um, Gina in Rhode Island, you know, she had state troopers at the border uh, stopping all out-of-state cars. Um, you know, that got everybody. Uh, um, Massachusetts, they kept starting and stopping a little bit. They had a pause. They had um, a rash of incidents around hockey, so they try. We tried a, a different thing. I mean, A, what I wanted to do is, is I opened. We opened cautiously, but we would never have to turn back. I just thought that would be um, a, a second body blow to what we had to do. So, um, and then I just tried to think out loud with people. And we did these um, evening, uh, you know, afternoon newscasts. And, um, you know, I had all the smart people there around me. And we only had a week's, few days more information, but just trying to tell everybody what we were doing, why we were doing it, and see if we could bring them along. My, uh, my best ally was, um, there were so many amazing, but I'll just give you one shout out to a guy named Scott Gottlieb, who maybe you've seen, um, Scott was uh, FDA uh, under uh, Trump, and um, he's really a trusted advocate. Sort of funny, because um, I had, during the early days, I I'd, I'd know about Scott, and I'd call him up, and it's Governor Lamont, I really could use your you know, help as we try and explain what we're doing in COVID, no response. Uh, two weeks later, Scott, this is really important, if I could just, uh, no response. Third time, he picks up the phone in a nanosecond, says, my kids have just been sent home. This is really real. What can I do to help? And I was on with him every day because it was not at all or nothing. I needed people that could get that balance. I mean, you know, a lot of healthcare, you know, we'd be in hazmat suits today. And a lot of business were saying, uh, open up. And, you know, they were circling my, the residents up in Hartford uh, every other day, you know, shouting open up or close down. One day uh, they were doing both. Uh, it was the um, hair salons. I don't know if you remember that. And the owners were mad as heck that um, they were not open uh, and they wanted to open up, you know, that next day, no delays, although people weren't getting to work. And the stylists were driving in the other direction. Often, um, you know, uh, women, um, you know, child care issues. And they were driving around in the other direction, um, shouting over the bullhorn, hair my voice, hair my voice. <laughs> So, so we opened up a week later, but that gave you an idea of some of the tension that was there as you try and get the right balance uh, going forward. Uh, today, I can tell you, um, it's getting a little more contentious. Uh, like I said, there's nothing better than a democracy when you're confronted with a crisis and everybody rowing in the same direction and speaking with one voice. And uh, Connecticut did that, I think, as well as any state in the country for which I'm eternally grateful. You know, now it's um, a little more fractured and um, you can't make me wear a mask and it's, you know, my body, my freedom. Um, and we're getting um, pretty revved up there. Vaccines, I, I can use a little help from you, you know, on vaccines. So the good news is the overwhelming majority, about 88, 89% of our adults are vaccinated. There's a strong, significant group, um, you know, 10, 15%, we'll see that will not get vaccinated and really feel strongly that um, we've given people a testing as an option. Um, just to, I, I gotta keep people at work. I, I can't lose corrections officers. I can't lose folks that take care of people face to face with special disabilities and a lot of them. So we had to do a testing option, um, which doesn't really work that well because Delta is so infectious that you can test negative on Monday and you're infecting people by Thursday. But anyway, we did what we could to keep people at work and uh, keep them at work safely. And, uh, you know, now I've said tomorrow, um, 
you know, following the lead of the CDC and the FDA, I want everybody um, uh, vaccinated. You know, President Biden said everybody in a company with more than 100 people. Um, we said uh, nurses in nursing home, nurses take care of people, people in public health, you've got to get vaccinated. And if you don't va get vaccinated, you can't come to work. And it's a bit of a gamble. We'll um, see how it goes. Uh, right now, um, Right now, I'd say that 85% uh, of our folks are responding. These are state employees and as such. They're coming forward. They're either getting vaccinated or saying they're going to get tested. Um, you know, it's complicated. You got to do, for me, I've got to negotiate everything with labor, so you uh, have to work that through. So we'll know in the next few days whether um, everybody at the end of the day did the right thing, you know, except for a few outliers. Uh, but I really think that I think we're going to be on the back side of this thing. Uh, I, I say that cautiously because I thought we were on the back side of it last August and then Delta hit. And as you look around the world, you know, you see, um, you know, it's not just Georgia and Florida, but it's now West Virginia and Michigan. It's Alaska. It's coming down from Maine. And, and we're not an island. And uh, that's why when people say we're in this all together, it really is true. And when it was getting kind of complicated, the messages we got, you know, out of the White House early on, um, like it's just going to be a case of the bad flu, don't worry too much about it. I worked with all my fellow governors, and we compared notes all the day, and we tried to speak with one voice, and I hope that sort of reinforced where we got to be. But um, I'll just say it's also a silver lining for our state, and I just want to leave you not on the COVID note that um, – we are getting through this. We're getting through this together. I firmly believe that um, the vaccines for younger people are coming. The overwhelming majority of people are going to take it. We're back to our new normal. Uh, this is a state that had been losing population for uh, you know 30 plus years. Last year, we gained uh, 25,000 net new families coming into this state. People rediscovering what makes Connecticut such an amazing um, state to live in, uh, knowing that a uh, New York's a great place to visit, wouldn't want to live there. That attitude's a little more now. Maybe you've got to uh, take, go down to New York once or twice a week, but you don't have to be there um, five days a week. And what you see going on in Greenwich and Stanford is also going on all over the state, which for me is really important. Uh, so a lot of our schools and, you know, Newtown and Derby that were shrinking are now expanding. And uh, it's not all old folks like me, a lot of young families moving into this state. Uh, a lot of businesses uh, coming into the state because they follow the talent. I think uh, one of the best things we did was keeping our schools open. New York City, they were closed. And there were a lot of young families that said, I'm coming to Connecticut. They came. And, um, and I know they're staying because uh, their kids are now registered in the schools going forward. And um, for me, uh, end where I started, um, I really thought this was a state that had a crisis of confidence. You remember GE, last one out, turn out the lights. Everybody was so negative on our state. And I'm just so charged up that people are feeling better about the state. People come up to me and they go, I'm so tired of being on the bottom of every list. We're number one in vaccinations, you know. <laughs> okay, that's true. But it's also a certain sense of pride. And, um, and, and that's what I'd ask each and every one of you, and Eric, to you, um, you know, keep uh, being champions for this state. It's an amazing state. I think we showed the rest of the country what we can do when we work together. And I think uh, it's going to get better and better. That's it. Thanks, everybody. It's getting better and better because we have great leadership. So thank you. You just... Uh, the way you articulated what we went through as a na you know as a state in particular and your own experience but it just subtly speaks about quality leadership so thank you ever ever so much i just want to open a first question then i'm going to pass the mic out to folks but um here at christ church we didn't want to you know because i really felt the same way it was like a body blow i had been here 16 months when we shut the doors on friday march 13th we wanted to be ahead of the curve because we didn't want anyone coming in and heaven forbid getting covid and possibly a fatality because we wanted to extend one more week 
And so we closed early. Um, it was so easy. Just went out the door, flipped off the light switch, and everything was locked. But to reopen was kind of monumental. And we thought we were closing for two or three weeks. But, you know, I had, we all had dreams and visions for the church. <clears throat> it was like a body blow to the momentum we had. But we just decided very early on we wanted to come out of this stronger than we entered the pandemic. It also forced us to um, fast forward on some initiatives we were doing. So we did a lot of strategic planning and then things like live stream. We now may have as many people watching the forum uh, on their computer right now or on television as we do in this room. We were thinking of doing that, but we thought that would be for the, the, um, the shut-ins in the parish, a smaller group. Uh, we'll eventually get to that. Once COVID hit, fast forward. So in Connecticut, with all your dreams and hopes for the state, what did you, you know, find yourself reorienting in terms of strategic planning to move forward and coming out of this stronger? And what things were kind of in the back, on the back burner, but this forced you to say, we've got to move them right up to the front and it seize the opportunity? Well, the first thing we had to, as the world went virtual, we had to um, keep up. And uh, so I, I mentioned the Chromebooks and what that meant for the schools, which was um, okay, but we had more Chromebooks. A lot of kids don't have Chromebooks. A lot of kids don't have internet. We had to make sure that uh, you had it and you had the support you needed. Um, telehealth, uh, just uh, enormously important. We were telling people, don't go into the hospital unless you absolutely have to. And uh, we changed uh, you know, some laws to make sure that telehealth is insured just like in person, what you gotta do going forward. Uh, telecommuting. I mean, we, um, you know, Northwest, Northeast Connecticut, where the uh, broadband's not as um, uh, reliable, you know, making a big effort to make sure you can do everything from uh, Brooklyn, Connecticut, you can from Brooklyn, New York, and to make those small towns that were losing population uh, grow population. Uh, for me, it's just a new appreciation of um, why I love Connecticut. I mean, uh, we were outside during the pandemic. We kept our... Um, we kept our parks and beaches and golf courses open, unlike other people. I thought it was kind of key to sanity. That's the uh, one thing you can do. A lot of people love having a backyard, and I think a new appreciation of open space and what that means, not just in terms of the environment, what that means in terms of our well-being. Um, you know, otherwise, I'd give you the strategic what we're trying to do broadly for the state, but you want to build on the momentum you got. We've got a lot of really positive momentum, and that's what I got to keep going. One of the things you may not be aware of is our preschool now holds a huge amount of their activity outdoors because that was the only way we could keep open. So they have groups meeting in the cemetery, in the memorial garden, wow. in the cloister, they call it the castle. That's the archway that connects the church to the um, parish annex in front of the uh, war memorial. And they've been using all sorts of space. They've set up gardens right out here. The, this pandemic altered the way we do education, and we're not going back. The families love it. Questions? Michael. I, everyone needs to speak briefly into the microphone when they ask a question. Uh, first off, Ned, uh, I commend you for your pragmatism. That's kept coming through everything you were saying. You were pragmatic about it, and I think we see examples all around in other states where there's a distinct lack of it, and so the hat's off to you for that. And maybe it's the businessman in, in you as well as sort of the, all the social things you've done before. But to Merrick's point, we, this immigration of folks that have perhaps been disabused that the city's the greatest place, uh, the emigration has been, in much case, tax, right? Tax on people, tax on business. Uh, and as I understand it, you have legislators that would love to get you to jam another tax on. And we hear it in other states, but my understanding is that you've kept that at bay. Can you just give us some sense of how you can use that kind of policy to take things forward another step? Yeah, Michael. Um, well, first of all, you know, first governor in 40 years that didn't raise income tax and, um, you know, other tax rates. And um, I think Bill Nickerson and Steve Meskers can tell you, you know, um, what, what's really helpful is to have um, there's a big Democratic majority. You know, you've got progressive Democrats, you've got moderate Democrats, and you've got uh, Republicans. And I've got to keep all three of them at the table. Uh, if one group 
steps out, you know, I have a lot less room to negotiate. But um, I got to say, this last year, um, we got the budget passed. We got the budget passed with uh, no tax increases. You know, Joe Biden gives a lot of money, I got to tell you, but still. And, um, and we got it passed on a bipartisan basis, which um, I think Libby knows that doesn't happen all the time. So um, uh, I, I think on a fiscal basis, we're in the strongest position the state has been since you know I've been paying attention. Uh, we've got um, about three and a half, almost three and a half billion in our rainy day fund, you know, which is enough to handle a normal recession. But Michael, there's nothing normal anymore. But at least it gives us I don't have to sit around jacking up taxes or hitting people's services, um, you know, for one things we expect, and um, and we're. We've got a long way to go with our uh, pensions. Uh, you were badly served uh, on both sides of the aisle going back 40 years in this state. And, uh, you know, the good news is we're paying off uh, $1.6 billion in principal this year. That's never happened before in the history of the state. Uh, the bad news is I've got $40 billion more to go. But um, we're flattening the curve, as they used to say. And I think that should give people confidence that um, – uh, unlike New York and New Jersey, um, we're not, no need to raise taxes, and we're getting our fiscal house in order. That's great. Uh, yes. Thank you, Governor. Um, assuming the uh, infrastructure bill passes in D.C., what will it mean for the state? And uh, there's been talk, all the governors have a once-in-a-generation opportunity. What's on your wish list? Well, it's going to rep... That's... Um, it's going to represent about a billion dollars a year to the state uh, for transportation and uh, broadband in particular, which is enormous. Um, first of all, everybody, you know, we had a little battle about transportation. You may have heard my first year. And everybody says, you're getting all the free money from the feds. You're, you're, you know, you're out of the woods. Remember, we have to put up 10 or 20 percent. So if that's a billion a year, I still got to do, you know, 100 or 200 million. And I got to figure that out. But more to the point, what does it mean? It means uh, 10 minutes off your uh, commute into uh, New York City for that one day a week you actually have to go there. And uh, you say, how, do, how does that work? You, you know, straighten out some tracks, you do some signalization, but it's really of uh, these bridges, these uh, rail bridges and the road bridges, but the rail bridges are 100 years old. So the train slows and picks up. I can fix a bridge. Bridges are expensive. Bridges are, you know, 500 million, a billion dollars, but each one can save you a good five minutes. That is transformative. I mean, there is no office space left in Greenwich right now, and Stanford is building up very quickly, and that easy access in and out of uh, the city when you gotta do it is um, transformative, and we can make a really good start on it. And um, they gotta, I, I'm a big believer in that, um, that bipartisan bill, and I just wish we could get some bipartisan support in the House so we could get that balance going forward. Uh, but we're ready to go. We've got our um, projects lined up. I-95, by the way, I'll just tell you this what you want to hear on a Sunday morning, but, you know, they always used to say, it's crowded, we have to add another lane, which is nonsense. Uh, we, we do the uh, heat studies on I-95, and you can see those two or three choke points, which are, you know, exits where everybody is lined up to get off, and each of those choke points adds you five or ten minutes at rush hour. So we can take a good 10 minutes off that commute uh, in the first few years if we get that bill passed. Governor, thank you very much for being here and uh, taking time on a Sunday. And from your lips to God's ears that we go on the backside of that, uh, that plague. But there's another plague that I, I think I know our friends that troubled us, and I'd like your thoughts on what we as citizens can do about it. And that is that when I was a kid, we went to civics class, and we learned that freedom was something that did not mean you can do anything you want, but that it was, it was about restraint, and that you couldn't uh, put, you know, yell fire in a theater, and you couldn't drive drunk and endanger people, and you, you had to put seatbelts on your kids. But today, we've got this notion of freedom that you can have a disease and spread it to others at will, and it's okay, and that should be sanctioned. What do you say to the rest of us as citizens who, need, who, find, who deal with people like that every day. It's a great, they're probably the greatest threat to our democracy, much more than COVID, because it overturns everything that we believe in. I can, that's, I was uh, at a um, school in Cheshire uh, 
few weeks ago now. And um, we we're saying we're getting the schools open, but we want the kids to wear masks. We want the teachers to get vaccinated. And we started getting shouted down. And then on the way out, it got you know quite physical. What surprised me was you know not that, but that it was a mother's with a seven-year-old in their uh, right hand, you know, shouting and uh, showing uh, just incredible anger. Uh, but what people forget is I must have had 150 people quietly come up to me and say, uh, thanks for what the state is doing and uh, to keep us uh, safe. And, you know, we early on when it came to, um, you know, getting vaccinated, um, you know, 50 percent of the people said, I'm not going to do it. And then 60 percent did it and then 70 percent did it and 80 percent. So I don't have to push people's face against the mirror to force, you know, I think friends of friends talking, Barrack and uh, ministers, trusted advocates, we're knocking on doors. Um, I, I think we're getting there, and I think overwhelmingly people want to do the right thing. And for those few that don't, um, you can't come to work. It's just dangerous. Thank you, Governor. Uh, particularly us uh, refugees from New York uh, are particularly appreciative of your uh, leadership. However, to follow up on some of the other comments, um, we try and extend uh, Christian charity to our friends and neighbors that maybe 15 percent who believe uh, we think wrongly that uh, uh, non-vaccination is an exercise of liberty and freedom. and uh, my question really is why, why the he hesitancy to, at this point, not impose a mandate? I'm old enough to remember, as a kid, when uh, seatbelts were mandated. It, yeah. There was certainly a public health and uh, education campaign, but it was mandatory. Uh, and, you know, there were our friends and neighbors said it was a matter of freedom. Um, driving around with a cell phone to your ear, or texting while you're driving, uh, I suppose, is, could be considered an exercise in freedom. Uh, but we had no problem in imposing fines and mandates uh, for that. Um, mandatory vaccinations go back to the beginning of the country. We could have well lost the Revolutionary War, but if it were not for mandatory vaccinations. Um, so we appreciate your leadership and we appreciate your urging all of us to get vaccinated. Uh, your public campaign has been very effective. But at this point in time, um, all of us know there'll be that 15 percent who are just not amenable to logic and reason. Uh, and it's a matter of public health. Um, uh, I, I'd like your views on that. Well, I mean, first of all, as of tomorrow, um, it is a mandate. You've got to be vaccinated. Or test. If you're in the public health space, vaccination only, no test out. If you're a state employee, more broadly, that. If you want to go to the Bushnell and see a concert, you got to show that you've been vaccinated. You want to go to the Foo Fighters, you know the Foo Fighters, uh, you got to prove that you've been vaccinated. Um, so a lot of this is happening independently. Um, all of our major businesses are beginning to mandate it. Look at a Delta. Did you read that article today in the Times? I mean, Delta Airlines, this is. Uh, you know, people were reluctant, only 70, then 80. They were 99% vaccinated. And uh, if you're not vaccinated, you end up uh, in a hospital. It's going to cost all of us, um, it could cost you your life, and it costs everybody $40,000. So you may say, why didn't I mandate it sooner? And I just, um, I wanted to try and bring people along. You know, sometimes I say, do this now by mandate, and uh, the level of anger and hostility, you can't tell me what to do, is, uh, you know, is, is real. Uh, but now is the time to do that mandate, now that we got uh, that number of people vaccinated. And, um, and I, I really believe that 99% are going to be vaccinated by the end of next week and will be in good place because we brought them along through persuasion, not just through mandate. Governor, thank you for being here. Uh, it's nice to hear you talk about pragmatism, for example, knowing the, cons the constituencies you need to have at the table in the legislature. Have you noticed in, in dealing with the pandemic and being governor um, and, and speaking with other governors that you feel 
there's much more pragmatism in this state as compared to other states. And you feel like, hey, we're doing it right in a lot of ways. And that other public officials from other states are willing to listen if you try to talk to them about, you know, this is what people expect of our elected officials. Have you given that thought? You talk to the governors privately, and broadly speaking, we are not as dissimilar as you may think if you see what Connecticut's doing versus what Florida is doing. You know, I talked to um, Doug Ducey, he's the Republican governor of Arizona, and obviously Arizona's open and not big on masks and vaccines are, you know, up to you. But Doug said, I have a tougher road to hoe. In Connecticut, uh, Ned, everybody knows somebody who died from COVID because we were hit that hard. In Arizona, everybody knows somebody who lost their job. Uh, so every constituency, be they red or blue, but it's bigger than that, has a different way of looking at it. And uh, uh, governors do what they try, you know, to move people along. I think some governors are politicizing this stuff. Some of those guys down south, I, I think, is outrageous. Telling a small business you cannot ask people to come in and wear a mask. Telling a school you're not allowed to ask uh, kids to wear a mask. I think that's outrageous. And I don't think it's um, Democratic, and I don't think it's Republican. Uh, but I'd say the broad majority of the um, governors I know, look, we're ahead of others because Connecticut you know, wanted to do the right thing, and it's sort of what our ethos is, and we're a little more community-minded than it's just my freedom or not yours. Uh, but uh, most of these governors are trying to move their states along as best they can. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, hey. and thank you very much for leading no us uh, through. <laughs> um, could you, I mean, this was a team effort, a team that you led, and um, could you tell us a bit about your team, the health experts? Uh, if I recall correct, uh, you returned a leading consulting company at the beginning. You were criticized for that, what role they had. And, uh, and I'm sorry that uh, these two years uh, kept you out a bit of the tennis courts. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a, uh, a different type of administration. Um, which I think has served us well. I did not want everybody from the Hartford ecosystem. I love you lawyers, but we had a lot of lawyers there. And um, I wanted people from a variety of different backgrounds. And uh, that meant um, you know, the most diverse administration um, we've ever had. It also meant folks with uh, executive or management experience. So uh, there was a job, uh, there's a commissioner of Department of Administrative Services, and everybody, oh boy, that sounds boring, a little bit of technology, a little bit of uh, purchasing, um, uh, who wants to do that? And I said, personnel, I said, I think it's the most important job in the state. You know, we call it, uh, you know, chief operating officer in my world. So I got a guy who spent, uh, you know, 12 years at IBM, Josh Jabal, taking the lead there. And then you may say, all right, what does that have to do with COVID? I mean, having an IBM guy, because a lot of COVID was a matter of persuasion and bringing people along. A lot of it was just a management nightmare. I mean, uh, we were scrambling the gro globe trying to get masks and trying to get vents when we thought vents were important. And then trying to allocate uh, tests and trying to allocate vaccines. And I'll tell you, the um, federal government was not that much help. There was, you know, there was no stockpile. There was nothing down there. And, um, and then when it came to the vaccines, it was, um, you know, this is under Biden. You know, we finally got our guidance from the CDC, because remember, all of us were lined up hoping we were ready to get vaccinated. At 12.01, when our age group, we were hitting press now, right? It's not the way it was around uh, much of the state. And then the feds, the CDC says, we've narrowed who's going to be eligible for the vaccine. It's um, older people people that um, smoke when they were in college, uh, people that are a little bit overweight, uh, people that have a comorbidity, and anybody who's in an essential business. Over to you, Governor. Well, that was no help at all, right? Because that included virtually everybody. So, um, you know, just from a management point of view, we, we did it differently. We said 75 and above, 65 and above, 55 and above. It was clear, it was easy to understand, I'm, a folks, I'm afraid older folks were much more at risk. We brought fatalities down. And, and that was, to some degree, a management uh, exercise. Um, 
We have Deirdre Gifford. I, I never would have had her, but she didn't um, want to work in Washington at um, Health and Human Services three years ago, so she took over as a, uh, for us at the Social Services and Public Health and brought with her a big network of folks that she could um, lean upon. I'll tell you, um, my wife, Andy Lamont, knows a lot of folks in healthcare too. So we had a pretty good way to get um, the best and the brightest to help uh, Connecticut, which is uh, punching above its uh, weight, I think. Hi, so ooh, qu quick question. So you were mentioning due to COVID and the pandemic, there were some innovations and regulatory changes in terms of adopting telehealth and coverage. And then we saw innovation on a global and national level with companies like Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Moderna with vaccines. Do you know of any success stories within Connecticut, maybe on a small business or a startup level, with medical technology or medical manufacturing innovation due to the pandemic? What I do know is that, um, especially in the greater New Haven area, um, uh, the life sciences, biotech, instrumentation is, uh, is big time there. You know, no offense to the Yale guys here, but Yale wasn't that great on computer science, so it was not like a leader, um, you know, back during that revolution. But when it comes to the life sciences, Yale is a leader and it's making uh, Connecticut an extraordinary leader going forward. And uh, I think um, the amount of investment going into uh, life sciences and healthcare and vaccines and uh, therapies is uh, going to benefit Connecticut, and Connecticut can continue to be a leader there. Governor Lamont, you were seen on Thursday opening up the casinos at Mohegan Sun with hundreds of unmasked people. You were seen at a billis, which fired all unvaccinated employees. You were seen unmasked with dozens of people. I'm wondering how you can justify the hypocrisy of masking our children in school when no one here is masked. We all know masks don't work, so why are you putting our children through this emotional torture? Well, first of all, um, those kids aren't vaccinated, and uh, they can't be vaccinated by law. And uh, I see what's going on in Georgia and Florida, where um, there are a million kids who aren't in the classroom because they've had to quarantine. Um, you're, you're right. Other places where we're um, you know, going around the state, I generally follow the rules within that state um, or within that community. And uh, so uh, that's how you know, we don't always wear a mask when you're surrounded by vaccinated people. Uh, everybody sets their own rules. I think uh, Connecticut or Greenwich is following its rules right here. And if I had to wager, I bet 99% of you are vaccinated. That's a big difference than your child's classroom. Hello, Governor. I'm a principal here in town in one of our public schools, and I just first want to thank you so much for all of your, the mitigation strategies, the mandates, because they work. Our kids were in school all last year, and that is a huge tribute to your yeah. leadership. So thank you for that. I'd also like to say I'm the mother of two teenagers and we're here today and learning that you are a historian and obviously we knew that you were an entrepreneur and you're a government person. What advice do you have for our young people? You gotta stay in Connecticut. This place is on, this is happening. This is where you wanna be. We, A, you know we got the best education system in the world. People from around the world come here to Connecticut. Uh, our cities and towns are coming back to life. Want to know another permanent change? I love the outdoor dining. I don't know about you. I hope that stays forever. I mean, you know, the average is a little sleepy on a Thursday night, and I need more. Um, and I got to tell you, um, in terms of opportunities, there are amazing um, job opportunities. We're expanding, um, you know, jobs all the time. Frankly, I I'd love to be your age. I mean, when I was your age, um, George Plimpton was at my graduation. He said, go home, unpack, there are no jobs for you. I don't know what to do with you when you graduate. Today is just the opposite. I mean, today I've got tens of thousands of really good paying jobs that we're having a hard time feel, filling. So I'd say the world is your oyster, especially right here. Okay. I want to thank you all of you for coming out. I was going to ask one last question. That is just how do we bring out the best in all folks? We've had too much division in our country and they're good people all across this country. You have helped to elicit the best in us. And uh, do you have any thoughts on just how we can do that nationally? You've done that so well on a statewide level. I, I just say, remember that feeling of unity we had after 9-11 where we knew we were all in it together? Remember a year plus ago when we realized we were being confronted by something we uh, couldn't quite understand and we were united? 
I mean, this state got so much done by working together, a country did, and um, uh, what I've got to do every day as governor is trying to keep that spirit together. We can disagree, but we disagree um, as friends. Anyway, uh, we got 99%. I still got to work on the other 1%. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're a good man. Thank you. Thank you.